All right, so I, I want to start with a small correction, which is that uh, I'm not really from USC. <laughs> I think of myself very much as being from New York. Uh, so I, I feel like I'm sort of the representative of the East Coast at USC, and I just want to you know, put that out there, basically. Um, right, so this is a talk about who gets to play. Uh, that's my Twitter down at the bottom there. Um, <clears throat> and it is about the leisure gap. Uh, a little bit, a little bit more about me. Uh, I am currently teaching at USC. Before that, I um, most of my career actually I was a web developer. Uh, I worked at a lot of different places, including eventually MTV Networks. Uh, and then I decided I wanted to make games. I went to Parsons. Uh, started up the New School Game Club. If anyone here wants to, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then after that, I worked for, I worked at a very small game company for a little while, and eventually um, moved on to USC. Uh, so my whole career, I've been in traditionally and in fact, uh, factually male-dominated sort of work environments, um, which was never a problem. I actually don't have any of those stories about horrible things that male coworkers said or anything. They were always very respectful, and I, you know, felt welcomed and included and so forth. Um, but you do start to, you know, it, it, if you feel like you're an outsider in that kind of situation, you start to notice these kind of patterns of interaction that, that occur. And that, that's kind of where this talk is coming from. And this particularly came uh, to my attention when I started working in games because I was trying to, it was a career switch for me. And I was looking for the ways to feel legitimate, right? I was looking for the ways that I could communicate that would get people to listen to me, that take me seriously, understand me as a designer, and so forth. Um, so that's, that's why I was paying attention. Um, and that's what made me start thinking about this. So what is the leisure gap? Who here has actually encountered that term before? A few people? Well, that's more than I was expecting. Cool. Um, the leisure gap is related to a concept in uh, the sociology and economics of labor called the second shift. Uh, there was a famous book by that name a few years ago, recently revised uh, by Arlie Hochschild. And the second shift is basically work that you do that is not paid, but also isn't voluntary. So it's stuff like doing the dishes, mowing the lawn. Uh, some people lump childcare in there, but most people split that out separately. Um, so you, you can think of it as housework. It, it's also stuff like you know getting the oil changed and, and, and that kind of thing. But the stuff you do to sort of maintain your existence that you're not getting paid for, the second shift. And in the book, uh, Arlie Hochschild gets into uh, quite a bit of, she, it's a set of case studies. I only read it recently myself, um, and I, I found it really interesting that she chose to do this as a set of case studies. She went and interviewed a couple dozen, um, well, hundreds, but then she chose a couple dozen case studies for the book. And the argument that she makes is that uh, we're in the middle of a labor revolution, it sort of started when women started entering the workforce during and after the war, uh, but it kind of stalled out at some point. And we're in this really kind of sticky situation right now where people are trying to get all of the same things done, uh, but now the, the female half of the couple, in the case of heterosexual couples, is also working. So it's sort of like, what, what do you subtract? And what, who does what, right? Like if you're both working, the, the division isn't as neat, so you have to work out something uh, on an individual basis about who's gonna do what. Um, and I would add to that, although I don't think, I don't know of any writers that are talking about this specifically, but uh, there's also a massive labor revolution in, in the form of um, mechanization and the, the gradual replacement of even things like uh, what we call thought workers uh, by machines. Uh, so we have a lot of displacement and, and uh, insecurity around our, our labor right now. Um, but tied up in that is what are we doing when we're not laboring? Right? And our word for that is leisure. And the leisure gap is a phenomenon that has been true, or has, has existed since we started looking at it. And that's that, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, when they self-report, men have quite a bit more free time than women. Uh, this is, there are a lot of different explanations for it, but they almost always uh, come back to women are doing more second shift work. This is, uh, these numbers here are from a document called the American Time Use Survey uh, that looked at how American parents specifically spent their time. 
Uh, it's a phone survey. It's run by the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics and U.S. Census. And the numbers here were from 2003 to 2011. They interviewed more than 124,000 respondents. Uh, and although it's had different names, this, this survey has basically existed since uh, 1965. So we can look at some uh, historical trends, like this one. Uh, this is also from a Pew analysis of uh, the Pew, Found Pew Research Foundation uh, analysis regarding how, how uh, this is the analysis of the ATUS study. Uh, and you can see, I hope, orange is uh, childcare, the light green is housework, and the dark green is paid work. On the left is 1965, on the right is 2011. And you can see a huge shift there, right? Um, it certainly looks more balanced, uh, less, um, less split into roles. Uh, there's some other interesting things about this. Um, <clears throat> those aren't percentages. If you'll notice, the bars on the right are both taller. Uh, so they represent the total amount of work that we are doing, uh, which went up a little bit from a total of 100 hours per couple to a total of 108 hours per couple, which is a whole work day. So, you know, if you're feeling that there's a lot of commentary on why, like, everyone feels busy all the time, and, well, we are busy all the time. Um, Also, women are doing more paid work. That's hardly a surprise uh, if you know any, if you've uh, had your eyes open since 1965. Um, if you look at the orange bars together, uh, they went from about 13 to about 21. The, the difference comes more or less equally from men and women, but so we're generally spending more time with our kids. That's great. Well, arguably. <laughs> uh, the total housework came down from 36 to 28. And a lot of that is probably like processed food and appliances and so forth. Uh, it looks a lot more equal, right? That the green area, the light green area. Um, but the number there is actually 18 to 10, right? So it's still about two to one. Uh, so while it is significantly more equal, it is not equal. Uh, and this is something that's uh, persisted. You know, it's, it's not a one-time phenomenon. This happens every time they do the study, and it has for many years. Uh, these numbers don't include commuting, eating, showering, and so forth. Um, and just as a, this is actually kind of a side note, but <clears throat> when women are paid to do work, uh, they don't get paid as much. This is also something that is held across a long uh, series of studies. It's called the, the wage gap. This one I'm sure everybody's heard of. Uh, that line at the top of this graph is 80%, not 100, just in case you missed that. Uh, so 78% is where we are right now. Um, every April there is a day that Oh, I can't remember the name of the day, sadly, but it's a day that represents how long women have been working in the year before they start getting paid the same way as men, right? So if you just sort of subtract that 22% uh, off the top, then 22% of the year women are working for free, right? Uh, and actually, Hochschild pointed out in, in when she tried to frame the issue of second shift labor that uh, if, you, if you take all of the time that women were spending on the second shift versus men, uh, it's about a month like a, a solid month of, uh, of days. So here's a clever illustration of, uh, or visualization of the, whoops, of the wage gap problem. Um, and that's not really the, the topic here, but it's certainly related. Um, and this is all, you know, it's carefully controlled. It may have something to do with childcare, something to do with choice of hours and so forth, but uh, overall, even when you control for all of those things, uh, we still find some kind of gap. It's uh, greater and lesser in different professions. Uh, for some reason, actually, podiatrists are like really terrible on this. The podi male podiatrists are apparently much more valued than women. Um, so even though we've had this kind of convergence of who's doing what and who's getting paid, uh, we still just overall the message here is that men's time is more valuable, right? I mean, they get paid more when they get paid, and they are um, not required to do things that are not paid as much. And the difference uh, comes in as leisure, but we'll come back to the, the details of that. Uh, one of the other motivations of this talk was uh, this article that was in Salon a couple of years ago, um, which noted the distressing <laughs> fact that uh, wage gaps 
and leisure gaps extend, uh, they start in childhood. So little girls do chores, little boys do chores, um, <clears throat> and they don't get paid, you know, when they, get, when they do get an allowance, the boys get more, pretty consistently. Uh, the split of chores, this is also something that's been studied a lot. The split of chores is not equal. Boys tend to do work outside the house. Girls tend to do work inside the house, which also leads, uh, it relates pretty directly to how men and women spend their time uh, when they do second shift work. Uh, so men, uh, boys can also kind of commoditize their work more easily, right? Like they can go and mow the neighbor's lawn, whereas offering to go do the neighbor's dishes is a little bit weird, right? Um, so we're, we're sort of, we have this inside-outside divide that, that contributes to a lot, of the other <clears throat> a lot of the other trends that we're talking about here. So this is from a University of Michigan study from, oh, looks about eight years ago now. There's surprising little, little data on how children spend their time. Um, you would think that there would, if nothing else, there would be a lot of market data about this because people are like constantly trying to sell things to kids. And maybe there is, but it's all like locked up where I can't get to it. Uh, so this is uh, probably the most recent available information that we have, and it's 10 years old, more than. Uh, this, this is uh, self-reported, like most of these studies are, and it's hours per week that kids ages 6 to 17 spent doing different things. This is how they split their time. Uh, and you can see schoolwork is up at the top there. That's good, right? We want kids watching, going to school, doing schoolwork. Uh, and then you kind of run down, it's sorted by, um, this is kind of subtle actually, it's sorted by the boys, right? <laughs> and you, I wonder why, <laughs> right? Um, but as you can see, I want to call your attention to the, the line that says chores there. Um, it is pretty clear from that presentation that the, uh, the line for little girls, the, the, the amount of, of uh, work represented there is about twice what it is for boys. And as a New York Times article that was covering this wryly noted, that's actually um, better <laughs> than, than it is for, for women and men. Um, so the, the other thing I want to call attention to is that looking at that line that says playing, which does not include television, does not include sports, like you know playing baseball or whatever, uh, it's literally twice as much playtime for boys as for girls. Um, and that's a difference in this study of about four hours every week. Uh, and as we know, you know, sometimes that'll be running around outside, playing tag, building Pinewood Derby cars, whatever. Uh, but almost all of it is going to be consuming some kind of digital media, right? I mean, that's just, that's how kids spend their time, just anecdotally speaking. Uh, but it's not just... Anecdotal. Uh, this is another area where there's a lot less. There are a lot less numbers, fewer numbers, fewer studies out there than you might expect. Uh, a lot of the money that goes into how do children spend their time and what does it mean when they spend their time with different media goes into are video games violent and you know do they encourage violence and so forth. And that's certainly a worthy topic of study. But at this point, it's like yeah, we studied that. Anyway, so here is the. One of the, the big pages in this report, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation in 2010. So it's reasonably recent. Um, I don't think I can zoom this for you, but if you look where the arrows are, that's total video game times as reported by boys and girls uh, every day. So boys report playing an hour and a half plus of video games every day. Girls report spending a little bit less than an hour playing video games. Uh, there's also some interesting splits here for race and ethnicity. That's not really the subject of this talk, but I just found that that was not really what I was expecting to see. I found that interesting. Uh, and again, that's per day. <laughs> 48 minutes for about 10 years, and that's just what we've studied, uh, that boys are playing, spend, are spending playing video games that girls are not playing, spending, that are, they're not uh, spending playing video games. Uh, I sort of used Photoshop magic to uh, <laughs> bring these bits of the chart together. Um, and this is looking at the split about where they are spending their time playing games. And <clears throat> you can see that cell phone games are actually about equal. 
Uh, boys spend a little bit more time with their uh, 3DSs or, or Vitas or whatever. Uh, but the big difference is, as you would expect, in console play. Um, and that actually corresponds to how, oh, and this is the note that I was trying to find before. Uh, this is something that um, I don't think it's discussed quite enough. Uh, why do boys and men play console games and women play casual games and uh, phone games? Uh, it actually has to do with that second shift split, right? If you're uh, keeping your eye on the laundry and uh, waiting for the repair guy to come along and doing that kind of um, more feminine work, uh, your attention is usually split, right? You don't get a whole lot of uninterrupted time. Uh, whereas if your job is to take the car in and get the oil changed once a month, it's kind of up to you. You can schedule that. Um, you can bring your Vita with you if you want to. Uh, you have a little bit more control over, over what you're doing. Um, and when you do it, so you have these nice, big, un unbroken blocks of time, which is what you need if you want to get good at Halo, right? Like, you can't just sort of, like, play Halo and then go do some laundry and then come back and play it. I mean, maybe you can, I can't. Um, and when people discuss who's a real gamer and so forth, I'm certainly not going to get into that here, but um, they, they do tend to refer to skill as, as one of the dividing lines of, you know, like, you have to invest time in it. That's what makes you a real gamer. Um, and it's just, it's important to note who has that time, right? Like, it's not, we don't all start from the same place in terms of who has access to, to the kind of time that you need. So one of the things that interests me about this, um, I mean, they're just, obviously the stuff so far has interested me too, but one of the things that interests me about this and that was part of mo the motivation here was, um, what does this mean when people start working on games? Um, if you look back at that time that boys have spent playing games that girls didn't, you could certainly construct an argument that, uh, that prepares them to be better game designers, right? They will have played more games, they will have played them um, more intently, they will have spent more time in a community discussing games, uh, and that, that could arguably certainly be an advantage uh, if you then want to become a game designer because you have that much more kind of literacy to start from. And when you sit down to design a game, you have a greater vocabulary of, of game mechanics to, to work with, depending, of course, on exactly how you spent your time. I mean, if you really did spend the whole time playing Halo, then, you know, maybe you didn't win. But the generally, you know, people do spend a lot of time playing Halo. I know this because I read undergraduate admissions applications. Um, <laughs> but they do branch out as well. You know, they, they play other stuff. Um, and more possibly... As importantly, they, they tend to belong to communities where people discuss games, like that's kind of what you do, and, and that affects their overall level, level of literacy. And, you know, I, I brought up the thing about undergraduates as a, a little bit of a snide remark, I guess. Uh, but that's one of the places where this comes up for me a lot, because I do sit on those, those committees, and, <clears throat> you know, when we're looking at, at applications, we have to decide, like, you know, who do we think is going to best fit the program? You know, there, there's a lot of different factors, but, like, literacy is certainly part of it. You know, if, if somebody is able to talk in a knowledgeable way about playing games and things that they've noticed about the mechanics and so forth, um, then they get, you know, they get our attention. And, you know, if there is an advantage that is given to some group over another in terms of getting there, then that's problematic, I would, I would, I would argue. Um, there's also, I mean, it almost pales in comparison to the problems of class and so forth and access to decent, decent education and so forth, but even within this uh, very rarefied sample of people that we get to see applying at USC, um, there's still this kind of gradient that, in my opinion, just shouldn't be there. There's also... Um, well, actually, let's, uh, let's move on to this little bit about... Google, um, not obviously about Google, but that gentleman there is uh, Dr. Brian Wells. He runs People Analytics at Google. Of course, Google has People Analytics, right? Like, <laughs> I think we all knew that, even if we'd never heard the term. Um, but what they what they call People Analytics is uh, HR. They're they're trying to solve their HR problems in a data centered way because they're Google. 
Um, but it's really interesting stuff. You know, they, they've done a lot of research. Uh, they hired this guy to kind of know everything there is to know about um, hiring practices and about psychology of, um, like, just psychology of labor, really, of psychology of the workspace and so workplace and so forth. Uh, and this is an amazing video, which I strongly suggest everyone here check out. Uh, even if you find this talk not very interesting, <clears throat> you'll probably find this one pretty amazing. Uh, it's about an hour long. It's on YouTube. I'll put the bitly up in, in a second. But what he's talking about is uh, trying to address a gender split within both uh, hiring and promotion and general workplace practices at Google. This is something that they're working really very explicitly hard on at Google. And they, they've found some really solid things in the course of, of uh, working on this. So check out the talk. It's an hour long. He gets into all sorts of things. <clears throat> One of the things that he spends a lot of time talking about is implicit bias. Uh, who here has heard of implicit bias? Lots of people. Hooray. Uh, so for those who need to catch up, <laughs> explicit bias is, you know, I don't like women. <laughs> implicit bias is I'm going to hire people who are really good at code. Um, and it comes in, I mean, this is like a many-headed beast, right? Like, there's so many ways that this comes out uh, that, that you would need to watch at least an hour-long talk by Google guy to, uh, to understand it. You know, they took the psychology students or whatever, and they put them into a, a lab, and they said, you're hiring for a police chief. Um, you're hiring someone to be the police chief of some town. And here are the candidates. And they put forward... Uh, well, they, they did an initial survey saying, do you think street smarts or school smarts are more important for being a police chief? And people said, well, we think school smarts overall are, uh, are more important because I guess, you know, a lot of the job is about management and dealing with city hall and so forth. So that was kind of the, the setting of the ground. And then they produced different kinds of resumes that uh, <clears throat> were more sort of school smart or street smart and they split the group in two, and they gave some people uh, a women's name at the top of the resume and some people a men's name at the top of the resume. And then they did the double-blind swap thing and so forth. And the, re the result basically was that um, they, always, they very strongly preferred the men, whether or not it matched what they had said about preferring school smarts. And they would retroactively justify it to fit the thing that they felt um, should be the case. So they would say, well, really, um, really, it's about street smarts after all. And, you know, and, and we all of us do this, right? This is not like some weird thing. They, they picked hopefully relatively representative humans and uh, ask them these questions. And, and you know, if, if you or I were in the same study, we'd probably do the same thing. Uh, so the thing about implicit bias is that uh, the only way to combat it is to know that it's there. Uh, Mr. Google here also offers uh, some really amazing, I think he has four different ways to combat implicit bias that are all pretty strong. The main one is know what you're looking for before, you know, know what the criteria are for some job, for some, uh, you know, maybe you're just looking for someone to work with on an indie project. Maybe you're trying to pick out somebody for a school project. When you're, when you're thinking about who you should listen to and who you should work with and, and so forth, um, think about what you want before you think about who is there. That's pretty simple, but uh, he said that that's the, the, uh, by far the most effective thing that they did to combat implicit bias uh, in their interview process. So as mentioned, this is not really about hiring. Uh, this is something that certainly applies to indie games too, for those of you who uh, identify as indie game developers. Uh, we just, we trade in a different currency, right? Like you may not be someone who, you may not feel that you make hiring decisions exactly, but um, we all do we all are, we are status oriented animals and we assign status based on um, things like in-group language, like, you know, do, can you speak knowledgeably about Halo, that sort of thing. Uh, and to the extent, you know, if you see this as a problem, this uh, kind of gradient that, that is established starting in childhood, then uh, the best way to combat it on a, on a sort of personal level is just to be aware of, um, of what's going on. To, to be aware of how your own thoughts are, are influenced by somebody who's able to like cite random Japanese games from the 80s or whatever, like, you know, that's cool, but is it really, is that the only way to be good at games, <laughs> right? 
Um, and there's also, of course, the countervailing argument that um, playing more games can kind of put you into a, a very narrow place. It can make you think that you have played all the games and you understand games and, you know, the way that you have seen games made is the correct way. Uh, so it actually, it sort of puts you into a, a cognitive box that can be really hard to get out of. Uh, and this is also something that we spend a lot of time doing at USC, uh, getting out of the, you know, games are Halo, our games are Halo, our games are uh, kind of problem. And hopefully, you know, people who identify as indie game developers are interested in all sorts of interesting and weird and uh, experimental ty types of games. And the people who don't spend all of their childhood playing Halo have some advantages in that regard, in that they, they don't have as much um, bias towards existing game types.